Good morning, everyone. I'm Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum Research. This is a special lecture presented from the point of view that you're going to run real quantum experiments with real quantum machines. As your lecturer today, I have the special pleasure and privilege to be here with you and to help shape your kindled enthusiasm into a path, a journey slicing, venturing deep into the world of real quantum computing. We can only do this step by step, piece by piece, peeling away one layer of approximations at a time. So let's start with one of my favorites. Real experiments do not occur in Hilbert space. They're inseparable from the imperfections and features of the laboratory. This is the land of quantum noise and noise in quantum systems. In this land of noise, we will start your own very journey from almost ground zero. And then we'll take a narrow but deep path that will expose you to some of the main ideas that you're going to run up as soon as you start to run quantum experiments. And that also open up the field of open quantum systems. And what better way to begin than with a simple hello world experiment? One which you could try to run yourself. This is a depiction of one of the fridges in a real quantum laboratory where you could run an experiment. And let's see what are some of the primitive basic building blocks that we could build out an experiment from that you have covered in day one and day two. One of the main concepts you covered, of course, is the idea of basis states, computational basis states, such as the cat zero and cat one that define what our computation will follow. In terms of a matrix notation, one can recount that this ground state would typically write for a single qubit, a zero one, and for the excited state or the one logical state, we write zero one. These are states written in the computational basis such as zero one, hence they take the following form. You also found the notion of gates, operations that you can perform on these basis states. A primitive, wonderful example is the X gate. The X gate maps zero to one and one to zero. Sometimes you can always call that a not. Not zero is one and not one is zero. But of course, as we know, one can not just have the basis states, but as a basis state, one can then create superpositions, combinations, linear combinations subject to normalization of these basis states. And so the X gate in the computational basis can be written as uh, zero, one, one, zero. And this is equivalent to the operations we see down here. If I wanted to express the operations on the basis, I will often use throughout the lecture this little nice matrix notation where the basis states of the input are written at the top uh, kind of like this this tells me that if i put in the state let's say one over here such as zero one what i'll get on the output is the column vector one zero so you can read that notation in the following way the x operator which maybe more formally we should write a hat on but since we'll use this all the time there's no need to do that at the moment, can also be written as in the following Dirac notation. It will take the state one and send it to the state zero and vice versa. It can also take the state zero like this and send it to the state one. So these are, if you want, three different ways to explain and express what this not operator does. And finally, there's one very crucial element of the whole endeavor, which is measurements. What kind of observables we'll measure? Here, for example, we'll play with and take the case of the Z observable. In the earlier lectures, you covered that the poly Z observable will give you the state um, <clears throat> zero times a phase factor of one when applied to this zero basis state. And the Z operator 
or gate applied on the one state will give you minus one to the one state, which looks like this. In terms of its representation as a matrix in the computational basis for the Z operator, we can again write that Z is equal to a two by two matrix for a qubit that is diagonal and has the element elements one, zero, zero, and minus one in the computational basis, which in my nice matrix notation, I like to write like this. There we go. And you excuse some of my handwriting here with uh, the PowerPoint. Now, that's what the gate would look like, but what we have here is an observable. We're going to measure the expectation value quite often of this observable and also the associated counts that go with that, which were introduced in lectures one and two. And we oftentimes write the expectation value of the quantum observable Z such as this, which is taken on the state, the final state of the wave function that will go into this box such as psi. In the earlier lectures and today, we'll also soon introduce a more general notion called the density matrix row that can also be an input to this. But that's a preview of what's to come. Let's instead focus on how we can take these few simple basic building blocks and use them to create a very simple but one illustrative experiment. And suppose I do the following. I will compile a set of sequences, a set of circuits. The first one here, this is circuit one, we'll call it, let's say for depth zero, there's no gates in the circuit. Then there's a depth one circuit, which has exactly one gate. Then there is a depth two circuit that has two gates. Uh, then there's a depth three circuit that has three gates and so on. And the structure of each of these different quantum circuits is that the depth is filled in by our favorite X operator, the poly X gate, or the not gate in this case, followed at the end of the sequence by a measurement. And we'll assume for now that this measurement is in the either computation or the poly is in the computational basis and the expectation value we can look at as one of the poly Z operator. So let's walk through this and see what we'll find. First, suppose I make the initialization, the case that we always start in the computational ground state. This is the typical assumption in these quantum circuits. Later, we'll unravel this and say that, well, that doesn't really quite work in practice. There's an error to this preparation, as we'll see in a bit. But suppose now we work in the land of idealization first, where we start always in the ground state in each of these circuits. What does the X gate do? Well, remember that X applied on zero gives us one. So this gate X here will flip zero into a one. So at the next step after the first gate, we always have the computational one state. After another application of the X gate, we always have the computational zero state. And similarly, again, the X state simply flips the zero to one every time. Simple, right? What do we measure for the expectation value of our poly operator? Well, let's take a look. The expectation value of the poly Z with respect to the ground state is one. If you're wondering how to compute that again, remember that you could write down the matrices. And in this case, this would look like something like zero, uh, sorry, one, zero, conjugate transpose times the poly matrix, which is one minus one, applied again to the state zero, which is one, zero, and if you work this out with the conjugate transpose, you'll get a matrix that looks like one, zero, and here you have one, zero, zero, minus one, and one, zero, you again find that this is equal to plus one, if you multiply these out. On the other hand, if the final state that goes into the measurement is 
the computational one state, then repeating this calculation, simply swapping the zeros and the ones, we'll find that the expectation value is instead minus one. In other words, the outcome of this general circuit for a given depth D, the depth, remember, is how many X gates we have in our circuit, is equal to minus one to the power of D. So if the depth is even, then we get plus one. If the depth is odd, we get minus one. Let's represent that as a nice figure. So here's what the ideal experiment of our case looks like, where we've taken the X gate and repeated the D times. My notation for that is to put the X gate in these parentheses and take it to the power of D. You can think of that as taking the unitary of X and X and multiplying in D times, and then measuring the expectation value of Z. So as a function of the depth, we see this oscillating function that goes from plus one to minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And here I've gone out to depth 100 because after doing this 100 times, I got tired. Wonderful. Now, I've issued the warning here that uh, this doesn't really exist. There are no ideal gates, ideal measurements, ideal preparation, ideal uh, operations. We live in a world not of Hilbert space, but of a noisy real life laboratory, not quite the idealized Hilbert space. So in our kind of near term intermediate quantum scale systems, what happens if I run this experiment? And here's what the output of one of these real quantum experiments looks like. So if you take that experiment that we just looked at and now you run it on one of the quantum machines, instead of observing the following curve, you're going to find the following curve. So clearly, when at the depth of 100, you would expect to find an expectation value of unity, you're now instead going to find an expectation value of, well, almost zero, but not even quite zero, something that's slightly larger than zero. So why is that? What's going on here? How can we understand this? And why is this uh, function, this result suddenly oscillating? So let's take a qualitative approach. Look at some of the features of this graph. See if you can pause the video and try to capture all the different qualitative aspects of what you see. See if you can take a first heuristic pass before we dive into a more quantitative explanation of all the features here. Essentially, the rest of the lecture is going to explain what happens on the slide as it already at the single qubit level will contain the vast majority of the building primitive blocks that you'll see in quantum noise. Let's take a few looks here at the very beginning. You'll notice that even at depth zero, we no longer even have the ideal expectation value of plus one. And that's really due to two effects. That's going to be due to the fact that we can't quite prepare the zero state to begin with. We call that state preparation noise or errors. And we also can't quite measure ideally what we want. In other words, this little apparatus that measures here is itself actually quite noisy. And that's already going to give us, even without any circuit in the middle, an error. Notice also that there seems to be some kind of oscillation happening here. We'll see that that's related to the depth of the circuit, which means it has something to do with this gate here. And as we'll find out, that's a manifestation. It's a characteristic of coherent quantum noise, meaning that the gate we actually apply in practice, although we think it's the X gate, it's not quite the X gate, but has some error here plus some epsilon um, times some other unknown gate X. Perhaps it's 
actually worse to write it as a as a sum like this as you see it's actually easier because these are unitaries the way that they combine is it's easier to write this as the ideal gate x times some noisy gate x but we don't need that just yet then what you notice is that overall the entire curve seems to be decaying away there's an overall trend so if i rather than my hand drawing show you a nicer uh, plot of this uh, envelope of the curve here plotted in this orange color that's a qualitative characteristic that has to do with incoherent noise stochastic random dynamics of the quantum system and that will be the opus magnus of this lecture and finally we also notice that even down at depth 100 where essentially we've mostly decayed there still seems to be fluctuations. Even within this structure at almost any level, we see that there is noise. It's not quite deterministic. In fact, if we run this experiment over and over again, we'll see fluctuations about each of these points. Those fluctuations have to do with the projection noise, noise due to the finite number of experiments we've done. The expectation values we often calculate in uh, your expect in your calculations in first two lectures have been those of ideal infinite number of experiments and infinite number of shots but we'll see that each time you do an experiment your measurement apparatus gives you a single answer one bit of information either a zero or a one so suppose i only ran this experiment one time well all the values here would just be one or zero and it's by doing this experiment over and over and over again that we can accumulate enough statistics over the random measurement outcomes to describe what the mean expectation value is doing faithfully. And that's why we talk about the mean here of Z. This is an estimate of that um, mean expectation value. So these are the main actors in what's to follow and in our noise. We have state preparation and measurement errors, which are acutely, have acutely the acronym of SPAM. Uh, we also have coherent noise associated with the gates. And we also have incoherent noise, which is associated both with, with which is associated also with the gates and the system itself. Finally, we have projection noise that's associated with the measurement itself that is going to play a role on top of and in addition to the amount of spam noise we have it can be a little bit difficult to separate out here but we'll take it one step at a time and so this curve is what you can keep in mind the rest of this lecture and then the rest of your journey here with the summer school that's going to lean us into the reasons of why we study quantum noise and that's there's there's this uh, funny cartoon here that tells you that your quantum computer looks now broken in almost every possible way but if you can understand the modes of failure the errors you can not only be susceptible to their whim you can in fact engineer and come up with strategies and protocols that can invert and undo some of those errors or mitigate them to a large degree and we'll touch on some of that in this lecture and also in a earnest lecture and in some of the following discussions here's what lies on our road ahead we'll first kick off with coherent errors since those will be the closest to what you're already familiar with and the gates will apply will be a combination of ideal gates times some error on the gates. And we'll look at the dynamics in the Bloch sphere picture of what the state or the density matrix will do when it's subjected to some Hamiltonian or some gate around some axis and how those errors accumulate. Then we'll talk about the projection and measurement errors and we'll really introduce the world of measurement and quantum measurement theory a wonderful close to my heart and fascinating world which will lead us into then discussions of state preparation and measurement error which then lead us into the wide vast and 
wonderful topics of incoherent errors, a really open system quantum dynamics, but more general quantum channels. And in this lecture, we only have the time and pleasure to expose ourselves to some of the core ideas. So we'll focus more on delivering some of the main messages on both understanding the models and discussion and effect of noise. And in this process, we'll just touch on places where the noise affects what you'll see, as well as how we can find the path to no noise. Let's dive into the first section of our coherent noise, starting with the refresher. And let's look at what the not gate depicted here on the left looks like at the level of its matrices and representation. So here we can see that one way to understand uh, how the not gate is implemented is to think of the Hamiltonian that would give rise to this gate. And that Hamiltonian that will govern the evolution of the system during time can be thought of as the uh, Hamiltonian, denoted here by h hat, is h bar omega. This is Planck's constants times some angular frequency divided by two times the x poly. The x poly, of course, in the computational nice matrix notation basis looks like this and is the familiar version. The way that we can actually implement in an actual ex experiment or in an actual device, this X gate, is by implementing this interaction, this Hamiltonian, typically with a drive, for some amount of time t. And so the unitary that corresponds to the total evolution for time t is the following, where we take the exponential of minus i t times the Hamiltonian times h bar. And we, if we look at the way that the actual product inside here looks, for instance, if I write this out as h bar omega over 2 times t um, divided by h bar with the minus i, excuse me, in front times x, that's what the insight here will reduce to if we plug in the Hamiltonian, we see that the two h bars will cancel. And the only thing we're left with is this parameter omega times t, the angular frequency times time. And so we can define that as the angle theta. And I'll call it an angle here because it's going inside an exponential that's imaginary. That construction is what we typically call or refer to as a rotation around the x-axis, since the x operator here is what's going to act on the quantum states, but it's now taken to this unitary um, with this exponential where we have minus i theta over 2 times x. And you'll see in a minute why the 2 is kept outside, because this will turn into a rotation of angle theta around the axis x. Now, you may have seen this before in the earlier lectures, but I'll just leave this as a nice exercise for you. You can try to use the Taylor series expansion of the exponential and the simple two properties that x squared is equal to the identity, x to the fourth is equal to the identity, and really x to the power of 2 times n, where n is some integer, is always equal to the identity, whereas x to the power of 2n plus 1, where n is some integer, is always equal to x. So we can separate out the exponential in its Taylor series into two terms, one that always give you an identity and ones that always give you an x. If you then group together those terms, and I'll leave that as a nice exercise for you to try, then you'll find that this rotation gives you two terms, a cosine of theta over 2 and a minus i sine of theta over 2 times x. So the unitary that we've generated by running this circuit with this Hamiltonian is the following. And that has a very nice visual interpretation. So let's put the math aside for just a second and let's just focus on the pictures. So imagine that your initial state, let's call it size, is the ground state. So we'll say that the state at time zero, the wave function of this qubit is the ground state, which in the block sphere, which was introduced earlier, can be depicted as a vector pointing up. And that's because the up direction here is associated with the z-axis. In other words, the expectation value of z for the state size 0 
is equal to zero z zero, which is equal to zero uh, acted like this. And that will give us plus one times the inner product of zero with zero. That's an ortho normal basis state, the zero and one. And so this is just equal to plus one. And so this vector has plus one. You can similarly verify that the expectation value of X is zero and the expectation value of Y is also equal to zero. And that's why we can think of the zero state as a block vector that points from the origin of the block sphere all the way to the unit sphere in the vertical Z direction. And here we have the X axis and the Y axis to remind you. Now I've also plotted here a black axis and that's because you can also think about the operator X and where that operator X would look like or point to. And so that operator X we can represent as this black arrow. That's the arrow around which our unitary, our rotation will occur. What I mean by that is that if we now look at the way that the X gate operates, coming back to here, we know that the ideal X gate will flip one to zero and zero to one. And the rotation of a finite angle theta around that axis X looks like this exponentiation. If you work out what Rx of theta applied to the ground state zero here looks like by using that expansion of the cosine of theta over two times the identity operator minus i sine of theta over two times the x hat operator. The whole thing applied on the initial state, which here will be denoted by zero. You see that the x operator will rotate the ground state around the x-axis by the right-hand rule. So you can take your thumb, put it along the x-axis, and then curl your fingers in the direction of theta. And it will track out this trajectory illustrated by this nice colors here on the block sphere unit circle. So that will be the picture that we have in mind. And exactly when we've acquired an angle theta of pi, meaning that this expression you notice at theta equals to pi is going to give us cosine of pi over two, which is zero times the identity. So that doesn't do anything. Minus i sine of pi over two, which gives us exactly one times x hat acted on zero. x hat acted on zero reminded we can remind ourselves what that does by looking up here. That will flip the zero into a one. And so this is just equal to minus i x acted on zero, which then itself yields minus i times the one state, excuse me, like this. We can more or less drop the imaginary factor in front of the i because this is a global face. So we can just think of that as one. I can challenge you to try to now work out also what happens in between for a finite angle theta. And what you'll see is that we'll exactly trace out this curve here, which is in the YZ plane and causes a rotation of the block vector, which is in red from the North Pole down to the South Pole. If you want, we can take a partial look at that. Let's continue the expression here at the top right, since we're running out of space at the very bottom. So we'll have that the cosine of theta over two, zero minus I sine of theta over two times one is equal to the state psi at an angle theta. I'll just denote it like this. And now what you can do as a nice exercise is to look at what's the expectation value of the X, Y, and Z 
quadratures for the state. And you'll find out that the x value is 0. And you can almost see that because we have this imaginary face here. That means that we'll be pointing in the y direction. And you notice that it's minus i, so that's why the circle turns over to the left. You know, and try to do that yourself. OK, if you've now figured it out, here's the answer. And you can verify against this. So we'll have sine of theta. And we'll have cosine of theta here. And you'll see now the justification for the reason as to why we've decided to, in our notes here, leave the factor of 2 in the definition of the rotation because the actual angle by which the block sphere will rotate is the angle theta, as we see here. Of course, you can continue this angle theta, and you notice that for increasing angle theta, we'll take a full circle all the way around the block sphere back into the ground state. In other words, Rx of 2 pi is equal to the identity up to a global phase. And so to summarize the evolution on the block sphere of a single gate, we start off in the ground state, which is pointing in the plus z direction. The first rotation, we'll call it the x gate, takes us all the way around to the south pole, where we're in the one state. The second gate, x, excuse me, will then take you from the one state, rotate you on this side of the block sphere, all the way back to one. And if, as you have more and more x gates, you'll continue to rotate yourself all the way around. So this is a visualization that helps us keep in mind what's happening. And it's a particularly useful one if you now have a coherent error. So let's get into the idea of a particular example of a very common coherent error. And that's a miscalibrated gate, a miscalibrated gate in amplitude. So we've seen that the ideal gate here, x is just the rotation around the x-axis of an angle pi. The noisy version of the same exact gate will denote by x tilde, with this little tilde at the top here. And visually, let's just imagine that it has the following model. Instead of rotating precisely by the angle pi, because maybe there's been a drift in the calibration, or maybe we haven't done our job well enough, we are going to over-rotate by some amount, by some angle. And so instead of ending at exactly 1, we'll end up at a little bit off to the side. I'm going to choose to model this noise in the following way, to say that our noisy gate, x tilde hat, or x tilde, is defined as by a rotation of exactly pi plus a little bit of an air amplitude epsilon. In principle, epsilon could be any angle, any number, but we'll mostly think of it as a small error. Recall now that a rotation around the x-axis always has this nice uh, exponential form and can be written as the sum of a term times the identity minus a term times the bit flip poly not gate. So let's take our model for the noisy gate and substitute in here the expression, simply replacing the angle theta by pi plus epsilon. Of course, I can now break up pi plus epsilon into two separate fractions that look like this, where it now looks like we have two angles. Uh, essentially, we have a rotation of an angle pi and a rotation of an angle epsilon. Now, keep in mind that x, capital X here, is an operator. But as any good operator, also the operator x commutes with itself, meaning that it doesn't matter if you apply x times x or x times x, since it's the same thing. And of course, also as with any operator, the x gate also commutes with the identity operator, since x times i minus i times x is equal to x minus x is equal to 0. So even though we are working with operators or matrices, 
that in general could be non-commutative, everything on this page commutes with itself. I commutes with I, I commutes with X, X commutes with X, X commutes with I, and so forth. So essentially we can use the following expressions just as if they were familiar numbers. And so we can break up the exponential into two pieces. One piece on the left, where we've simply grouped the terms from the left, and one piece on the right, where we've uh, broken out into, and I see a typo here, this should be the error term, epsilon. Or if you want, actually, maybe it's better to group it the other way, which is exactly what we will see in the next line. Let's choose to put the error first before the ideal rotation in terms of the algebra. But you notice that the way that these gates get applied is that this gate gets applied first before this gate because they act on the right on a state psi in general. What we've also just shown, and I challenge you to maybe show it yourself and repeat these steps a little bit more explicitly, is the following identity, which is really, really helpful and useful. So I suggest you pause the video and work this out for yourself. Show it that a rotation of two angles is just the product of the rotations of each of the two angles. And in fact, you can try to show that because they commute, you can flip the order as well, and it doesn't really matter. So we can now write down this noisy gate as the product of two things, the ideal gate times some other non-ideal gate, a rotation of a small angle epsilon. Pictorially, what we've just done is our first decomposition of a noisy gate into some error, small error, which happens here to be a unitary, times the ideal gate. And this is a very useful notion and a very useful idea, both when we work with coherent noise and, as we'll touch on later, incoherent noise. These decompositions tend to play a key role in this analysis and discussion of, let's look at what the total circuit unitary will look like for a depth D. In the case of an ideal circuit, and also in the case of the noisy version of the circuit, where we'll use the decomposition of the noisy gate into an ideal gate preceded or followed by, it doesn't really matter because they commute, a little noise unitary. Again, repeated d times and then measured in a logical computational basis in the z. Recall that the X gate is a rotation around the X axis of an angle pi, and the noisy gate is a rotation around the X axis as well of angle pi plus epsilon. So we have this nice decomposition we saw on the last slide. The total unitary is simply repeating that D times, or taking the X gate to the Dth power, which of course we can write like this, D times. Write that in the following way. We have R of angle pi rotated around the x-axis. And we've repeated this now d times. d times. Remember from the earlier slide that a rotation around x of an angle theta plus, uh, excuse me, times a rotation around the same axis of an angle phi is just equal to a rotation of the sum of the angles. And so on the left here, we can use this rule to apply it sequentially, for example, to the first two gates. So we'll have 2 pi times rx of pi dot dot dot. And repeating this over and over again, we'll find out that we just have a rotation around x of d times pi, d times pi, where d is the depth. On the right-hand side, in the noisy case, we have the noisy version of this gate, repeated d times. And so in that case, we'll instead have this repetition looking like this, where we take the ideal gate followed by the uh, noise component, repeat it several times. We could reshuffle the order any way we see fit. And so initially this term might look like this, where we have 
rx of epsilon rx of pi rx of epsilon rx of pi dot 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 let's say that we group all of the rx of pi terms to the right moving all the rx of epsilon terms to the left so then we'll have an rx of epsilon rx of epsilon dot 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 until we have d repetitions of that and we'll have rx of pi dot 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 repeated d times using the exact same beautiful sum rule that we used on the left here that two rotations around the same axis followed following each other is just the same as having one rotation of the sum of the two angles this way we can group the terms as rx of epsilon times d and rx of d times pi just like this therefore the total noisy unitary noisy denoted by the tilde on top here is just the product of the ideal unitary u total which we have here on the left multiplied by a noisy U rotation a noise unitary um, here as rx of d epsilon so let's look at what the effect of this total noisy unitary is on the final circuit quantum state assuming that we start off in the ideal logical zero state to begin with we can do this by using the identity that we found earlier which is that a rotation of an angle theta around the x-axis is equal to just the cosine of theta over 2 times the identity operator minus i sine of theta over 2 times the bit flip operator x. The final state in the ideal case, I'll denote that by psi final, is equal to the total unitary u total times the ground state R substituting in u total um, as cosine of d pi divided by 2 times the identity acted on 0 which gives a 0 minus i sine of d pi over 2 let's put the parentheses here times x acted on 0, which, of course, we can just replace by 1, gives us the final evolution of the state. Now, you recall what cosine and sine look like. So you notice that cosine of d pi over 2 is going to be 1 for d being even. Cosine of 0 is 1. Cosine of pi is 0. Cosine of 2 pi is the same as cosine of 0, and so on. And the sine term will likewise also complement this. And this will be 1 for d even, uh, sorry, odd and 0 for d even and likewise the cosine is 0 for d odd and so we can summarize that the final state is going to equal ket 0 for d even and ket 1 for d odd this is modular global phase. What I mean by that is that you notice that there's this factor of I sine here. So in fact, there is a little bit of a global phase, uh, or not a little bit, there is a global phase, but we won't have to worry about that uh, since, as you covered in the earlier lectures, it's not measurable in the case that you don't couple this to other systems or levels, other levels of the qubit, which for an ideal qubit don't exist anyway. 
Now on the right hand side, let's see what the noisy state is. In fact, we can use the result from the left to say that the final state of the noisy circuit, denoted here by the tilde on top, is going to equal Rx d epsilon, d times epsilon, times, and we don't need to write out u total times the ket zero because we know the result of that from the bottom left, times zero for d even and one for d odd. And now simply we have to calculate the rotation of each of these angles. Now I'll leave that as an exercise for you. So this is maybe um, exer exercise 0 0.a <laughs> as our first exercise is to actually calculate both of these expressions explicitly. And as exercise 0 0.b, find the expectation value of the z state. in both cases. Now, it's easier perhaps to almost write that down, by the way, in the case of the combined rotation, since we'll use that on the next slide, but I challenge you to still work these out yourself. So let me just go back to the top here and recall that the total noisy unitary can also be written as a rotation around x of an angle pi plus epsilon to the power of d, which, as we saw on the earlier slide, is really the same thing as the rotation around x of d times pi plus epsilon. And when we now apply this on the cat zero state, we'll get the final uh, state, z, Sorry, we'll get the final state, psi final. And we'd like to then project that onto the Z operator introduced earlier. And if you follow these steps, this is essentially your exercise B, you will find that on the right-hand side, we have cosine of d pi plus d epsilon. Whereas on the left-hand side, we just have cosine of d pi. Cosine of d pi gives us this alternating plus minus one sequence, minus one plus one minus one plus one, that we saw earlier in the first uh, introductory part of the lectures, and that you see here. So it goes from plus one, which is representative of the ground state, to minus one, which is representative of the logical one state oscillating back and forth as a function of the depth d but in the noisy case we start close to that however over time the coherent error builds up let's compare to the full experiment which you'll see here on the left you notice a lot of the same characteristics and features appearing on the left as on the right first of all we have an intersection here of zero at the same site as well as oops as well as here at this location now, there's some features that the coherent error cannot explain from this, such as the decay that we also observed on the left-hand side here uh, that seems to do this. That's going to be explained by incoherent errors, as I mentioned earlier. We notice that we've exactly reproduced for a three degree error on the amplitude, the um, modulation of the signal. And the coherent error also will not explain this offset here. We'll see that that's spam as well as some projection noise. And, and uh, by spam, I mean state preparation and measurement error. As well as the projection noise and measurement noise that's going to cause these kind of fluctuations. Uh, whereas you see here, we have a kind of perfect expectation value. That's because this type of expectation value essentially assumes that you have an infinite number of shots. But in principle, in practice, rather, you can't really do that. A very important central point of this whole discussion that is illustrated by this example is what's the worst case performance of the algorithm you want to run uh, up here. In the ideal case, this gate is missing, but as we've seen, of course, in the case of coherent error, we have this gate. 
what's the worst case error that we have and how does it scale as a function of the size of the error? We'll denote it here by a little epsilon. Well, you can take, do that by looking at the expectation value difference between the noisy case and the ideal case, recalling that in the ideal case, we have um, cosine of d pi. In the noisy case, we have cosine of d pi minus uh, d epsilon, or rather plus d epsilon. So we'll take the difference of these two, the noisy and the ideal expectation values. Remember that cosine of d pi is minus one to the power of d. Use the sum rule, recalling that if you want cosine of a plus b is equal to uh, cosine of a cosine of b minus sine of a sine of b. And so here on the left, we'll have um, cosine of d pi times cosine of d epsilon minus sine of d pi sine sine of d epsilon. Recall that, or prove to yourself rather, that sine of d pi is equal to zero and that cosine of d pi is equal to minus one to the power of d. So this second term here is zero. This first term here becomes minus one to the power of d. And so putting this all together, we'll find out that we have minus one to the power of d times cosine of d epsilon minus one. So this is the difference between our ideal and our noisy value. And that's the difference you see here on the right hand side. More importantly though, what happens is a function of small error. So recall, prove to yourself that the Taylor series of cosine of x is equal to one minus uh, x squared over two plus terms of higher order, let's say x cubed and higher, or x to the fourth and higher. So Taylor expanding that <clears throat> expression, we will see that we we find that uh, to lowest to second order, essentially to lowest order that's noticeable. This expression is minus one half, minus one to the power of d times uh, d uh, squared times uh, epsilon squared plus terms of order epsilon cubed or higher. The central message here is really that the way the difference between your smallest, uh, between your ideal expectation value and your noisy expectation value scales here quadratically as epsilon squared in the noise. So coherent error for whatever depth circuit here you have will build up in a quadratic way and will affect your performance in this kind of quadratic impact. And that's quite strong, and quite bad. You can compare and contrast this to incoherent noise, which we'll get to at the end of this lecture, which will have a linear scaling on algorithmic impact as opposed to quadratic scaling. So coherent noise can build up uh, because of its coherence building up. It's as a quicker way of propagating, so to speak. Of course, it also has this funny features. For instance, you notice that depth 60, at depth 60, in fact, there's no error whatsoever. In fact, we recover the perfect circuit. And this is a kind of revival that you can think of but obviously at this particular depth, coherent noise pulls you away to a really, really, really terrible error.